If you will tonight, take your Bible, open up with me to 1 Timothy, and we'll get to 1 Timothy in just a bit. We are starting a brand new series of messages, kind of kicked it off a couple of weeks ago, um, and I'll touch on that in just a moment. But the series is called Challenging Committed Christianity. Challenging Committed Christianity. And tonight we're looking at a message simply titled Commitment versus Dedication. I want to start out and I want us to ponder a simple question uh, that's going to be posed in a variety of situations. The question is merely, why? You know, the kids, uh, they know how to say that real, real well. Uh, why? But why? But why? There are good times to ask that question, and we've got to ask that question tonight. If we tonight believe that we know the truth of the gospel and we have been saved by the gospel, then why have so many in the church never told another soul about it? Why? There are approximately 300,000 churches in America and 228.1 million professing Christians. That means that the average size congregation should be about 760 people. However, the average size congregation all throughout the United States of America is 75 people. Why? That's just under 10% of professing Christians. Why? Churches used to have Sunday night, Sunday school, midweek services. Many have eliminated those and gone to one service. Why? Other Sunday pursuits have not reduced. People are, in fact, increasing the things they used to do on Sundays. I remember a day where the ball fields, you would never find anything going on at the ball fields on a Sunday. Now the ball fields are packed. Why are there so many in our society who used to go to church, used to serve, used to be faithful? We have easy access to the Word of God. Tons of translations have been created because we all know that the KJV is way too difficult to understand. And so therefore... Um, all these different translations have popped onto the market because that will help people to know the Word of God better. But why? Why is Bible knowledge at an all-time low? It has not increased. It's gotten significantly worse. In fact, basic Bible knowledge is at an all-time low. You go talking to an individual about the Lord, there used to be a time where there was at least a basic foundation. You could talk to them. You could start there. But you can't do that anymore. Most people, you cannot just go up to them and, start, and just bang, go right into the gospel message. Because they're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So you got to spend days and weeks sometimes building a foundation that people used to have. Well, I thought all these Bible translations was going to cure it. Why didn't it? If we believe that we are saved to serve, why do churches have to beg for workers? I think these are good why questions we really ought to ponder. Two weeks ago, we dealt with Galatians chapter 1. The Apostle Paul is chiding the church of Galatia because they have been so quickly swept up in false doctrine, not just any false doctrine, but very specifically the false doctrine of a false gospel. And they have embraced a legalism from uh, the church of, or the people that are there in Galatia. As I presented two weeks ago, there's a couple of glaring problems that are in our churches today based on that message. Number one, I think that a lot of our churches all across America are filled with the unconverted. They are filled with the unconverted. Those churches where you've got 75 as an average congregation, even out of that, how many of those people are genuinely converted? You say, well, you, you can't judge that. Well, sure you can. When you listen to the convoluted message of the gospel that is given today that is not the gospel, but it adds this and it adds this and it takes away that and all this kind of stuff, it's not the gospel. And yet people are flocking to churches. And folks, one of the things that we are seeing today, I, I'm going already off on a tangent here. One of the things that we are seeing today is we are stripping off identifying names off of a church. Why do we do that? Why do we have the first generic church of the corner of this and that? 
Why do we have that? Because what we have done is we have brought in, we have attracted anything and everything that seems to testify of some sort of a religious experience. Oh, well, that's okay. Come on in. Come on in. You got to be okay because you talk a good talk and everything else. And so we have built churches that don't have any standards. We have built churches that have no convictions, no biblical foundation. It is a generic statement of faith. Every once in a while, and I always will try to do this, if I find an author that I know nothing about, I will try to find out what, is their, what are their beliefs. Do you realize that you can put up the beliefs of just about any person, anywhere, and line them up and they all say the same thing? They are written so generically that everybody's accepting of them. And they don't really say anything. So churches are loaded with the unconverted. Secondly, churches are unwilling. Those churches that know the truth are unwilling to con confront the untruth, to confront the lie. Because, well, my great aunt Susie, you know, she's just such a wonderful person. And, and, and I know she's not, maybe not saying it like we'd like to hear it, but, you know, and says all this kind of stuff. And it's like, there is no sound of a testimony in there, but we accept it because we don't want to offend great aunt Susie. Why, that just up, 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 uproot the whole family dynamic. Well, let's worry about the family dynamic and let aunt Susie just go on to hell. I mean, it doesn't make sense. But that is the mentality today. That is the way it's portrayed in books. It's the way it's presented everywhere that you go. As we begin this series, I'd like to add a third reason as to why these why questions are, are being asked and why we don't have good answers for it. It is because we have too many committed Christians. Now, we're going to put Christians in the air quotes, right? Because we're not real sure everybody that's professing is possessing, but we have got too many individuals that are committed, but they're not dedicated. You say, well, what's the difference? Well, I would challenge you that God doesn't want committed Christians. He wants us to be dedicated. As we start this in tonight, let's clarify commitment. Let's clarify commitment because the word commit and commitment and committed and committeth and however else it's seen in the Bible, that word is not a bad word. Let's look at these verses. There's going to be a bunch we're going to look at, but you won't get lost. We'll just keep turning to the right. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 11. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. Look at verse 18. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies, which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Let's go to chapter 6. And look at verse 20. Chapter 6, verse 20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. Go over to 2 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Go to verse 14. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Chapter 2 and verse 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. The next book is the book of Titus. So go to Titus chapter 1, verse 3. But hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment, of God our Savior. All right? All these times that we see the word commitment, committed, it's good, right? Nothing wrong with the word, good usage of the word. What does the word mean? The word means to give or to entrust to somebody with the understanding that the right thing is going to be done with it. So when these things have been entrusted, it is understood. These are good things that have been entrusted. Now do the right thing with it. And it is, it is just an understood they're going to. The problem is not the word. It is with our usage of the word based on 21st century interpretation. That's why I say commitment and dedication are two different words. They mean two different things. Usually what we will do is use them interchangeably. But the problem is, is that we've got so many people in church that think they're committed, but we don't have enough dedicated people. 
And we are in desperate need. The Lord's in desperate need of dedicated Christians. Let's spell this out for our culture today. Somebody will say, I have made a commitment to this person. I have made a commitment to this organization. I have made a commitment to this team. I have made a commitment to this board. I have made a commitment to this particular position. One individual will have several commitments. And how many times will people say, oh, I've just overloaded myself with commitments. I am stretched too thin. I am stretched too far. Because that's what commitments do. They split you. They divide you. They get you going different directions. Christians will refer to themselves as committed Christians and think that it's really a good thing. But by our definition today, if I am a committed Christian, that means I am split between a lot of different good things. And when the term of a commitment is finished, the committed are finished. How many times has somebody said, a Christian... They have served the Lord in a particular capacity. They were committed. Oh, they were in that spot week after week or whatever. I am committed, but now I'm done. I've done my time. You know, that's what they say in C at CCNO once they've been released. They have been committed to CCNO. They got committed to the state penitentiary, and I did my time. And they're over. And they walk away from it, hopefully never to return. Now, let me ask you, Christian, is that what you want out of your Christian walk with the Lord? Do you want that definition of commitment? I would hope we don't. So let's define dedication. Defin defining de dedication. To help us understand the word dedication or dedicated. Let me put this into terminology that's used in the electronics world, computers and all that. A dedicated line is a network that isn't shared. They don't call it a committed line. They call it a dedicated line. The line has a guaranteed level of performance. A dedicated line tends to be more secure because they are isolated from the public internet. And that is just right off of a website describing computer terms. Now, why do they use the word dedicated? Listen to all those adjectives that are in there. It isn't shared. Guaranteed level of performance. More secure. Isolated from the public. Huh. Now that sounds more like a Christian, doesn't it? Not just a computer line. Let's apply this to marriage and let's toss in another word. How many of you made a decision at some point to marry somebody? Would you please put your hand up? All of our married people better put your hands up, okay? So you made a decision at some point. That decision took you in al to an altar where you recited some vows. Were those vows a commitment or a dedication? They were actually both. But what you may not have realized is how the both fit in. Think about what you said. Well, first of all, let's go to Matthew chapter 19. As we define this tonight, which did you want? Do you want your spouse to be committed to you? Or do you want them to be dedicated to you? What do you think? I would think you'd want dedication. All right, Matthew chapter 19. Let's look at the Lord's words here, and then we'll spell this out a little bit. Matthew chapter 19, starting in verse 4. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. That's dedication, folks. That's not commitment. Your term of commitment comes to an end at various stages. And depending on how much you like what you're doing. There's an awful lot of committed marriages out there, and they stay committed so long as they like each other. So long as everything's going all hunky-dory. So long as, as, you know, I'm getting out of the marriage what I want. You realize that's the wrong way to look at marriage? Guys, you cannot look at marriage and say, I love her so long as I'm getting what I want out of marriage. Ladies, you can't look at him and say, I love him so long as I'm getting what I want out of marriage. That's commitment. But it's not dedication. 
you are committed to a point. Listen to the vows that we took. The vows said something like this, and the way the commitment is is because they included the good with the bad. You were married for better or richer or in sickness and in and forsaking all others. All right? So that means you have to be committed. Some folks are only committed so long as all the good things are happening, and all the better, and all the richer, and all the health, and as long as they haven't found somebody else to forsake your spouse for. Follow? Here's where the dedication part comes in. It's in the next part of those words. You, you promise to love each other, to take each other in marriage, for better, for worse, richer, for poorer, sickness and in health, and forsaking all others, to love and to cherish from this day forward until death do us part. See how dedication is there? I am going to love and cherish every day, even when it's bad and worse and poorer and sick. I'm going to forsake all others. I am dedicated no matter what. That's the difference. When the Lord, when we... When we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, the Scripture looks at us and describes us as the bride of Christ. Paul said he was jealous to pre present us to the Lord as a chaste virgin. He didn't want us committed. He wanted us dedicated every step of the way. You think about how many marriage commitments have ended in divorce. The statistic is 50%-ish. The sad thing is that the statistic is the same in the church as it is in the world. No different. Now, because I know divorce touches a lot of lives and things like that, uh, let me just be careful to point out that there is a lot of damage that's done to those who are innocent bystanders in a divorce. There can be adultery that takes place. There can be abuse that takes place. There can be a lot of things. When the unbeliever departs, there's always going to be left somebody behind that is that, that innocent factor. And I'm not talking where, you know, they have irreconcilable differences and we're just, we don't want to get along anymore. You know, kind of a Hollywood divorce, the way things are. That is crazy when you listen to the stories and all that stuff. Um, and I know that happens. And even if the divorce came about because of wrongs done by both parties, never forget that divorce is not the unpardonable sin. All right? Never forget that. God can and will forgive and heal. But I want to take what we've seen so far, and I want us to look now at the distinctives of dedication. The distinctives of dedication, because the Scriptures are going to give us some very specific distinctives that show us the difference between a dedicated Christian and a committed Christian. Take your Bibles and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, what do we need to see and understand in order to grasp this idea of dedication versus commitment? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, it starts out with a question. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For you are bought with price." Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. So how is dedication different than commitment? Dedication, first of all, acknowledges ownership. Dedication acknowledges ownership. We belong to Christ. We were bought with His blood. We are a purchased possession. Therefore we have no say. We have no rights. Every one of our rights, Christian, is swallowed up in the blood of Jesus, that we accept it as payment of our sin. That's dedication. And we need to view our lives like that, that I don't have, it's just like with the tithe. And so many times people think, oh, the 10% belongs to God and the 90% belongs to me. No, it doesn't. 100% belongs to the Lord, right? Isn't it all His? We know that 10% ought to be brought into the storehouse. It ought to be brought into the Lord. For the Lord's use, the, we can also bring in our offerings and things like that. But regardless, everything that is left in our pocket, so to speak, still isn't ours. We're just holding the purse, so to speak, for the Lord. 
And we have to check it out with Him. Why? Because He owns it all. And if you're here tonight and you're saved, He owns us. We cannot say, well, I gave my heart to the Lord, but the rest belongs to me. Absolutely not. Ownership means all. How many of you have ever bought a car before? How much of that car is yours? Every bit of it. You say, well, no, part of it's owned by the bank still. You know what I mean. You didn't come in on two wheels tonight unless you brought a motorcycle. Ah, see, I know where you're going to try to catch me on that. Unless you brought a motorcycle. But you came in on four wheels tonight. All four wheels belong to you. Everything that is on those four wheels belongs to you. Everything that's in those four wheels belongs to you, right? Okay. When we were owned by the Lord, it all belongs to Him. Now, there is a sense in which this is true about marriage. Take a look at the, what follows here. Remember that the chapter and verse breakdowns weren't in the original text. It was provided by translators to just kind of help with the flow. So after we are told that we have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Huh. Did you ever look at marriage as an ownership? Now, I know that you talk about, oh, if, I could get all sorts of bad press on that one, right? Oh, you mean ownership. Ladies, how many ladies are married? Guess who you belong to. Guys, how many of you are married? Put your hand up. You belong to the same person that just raised her hand sitting beside you, okay? That's ownership. You say, oh, I don't like that. I don't, no man owns me. No woman owns me. Well, then you fight it out with the Lord in the Scripture. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. Now, it doesn't mean that one spouse is the other spouse's slave. This does not justify any kind of abuse, physical, emotional, spiritual, sexual. It does not endorse any of that. It does not mean that one spouse can say to the other, you have to, you have no choice, you are mine. And this does not mean that a spouse has more authoritative of a voice over their spouse that is greater than God's voice. We still ought to obey God rather than men, right? Okay, so that's not what that is teaching. But it is teaching that when the two became one flesh, they came into ownership of each other. And that's the way it ought to be. It, so many marriages, they don't even see it as one flesh. Everything's separate. We have his and hers. You know, it's okay if you have his and hers towels, I guess. But everything else is separated in their marriages. And then they can't figure out why they have such division, why they're not connected. Well, start putting it all together as one. When my wife and I, even, and in fact, we did this before we got married. We were getting close to the time for the wedding and everything else. We started putting everything into one banking account. It, it's going there. Why? Well, we're one flesh, so we're one account. Our vehicles, everything has both of our names. House has both of our names. Everything's in both of our names. Why? Because we're one flesh. And I tell you what, make things easy on yourself. Find out what all the legal jargon is that has to be put on something so that when you die, the spouse gets it right now without hassle. You don't want to put them through that, right? You want to make things as easy as possible in the event that, that you leave this world. So ownership has got to be acknowledged. Every bit of this ownership in marriage is exercised off of the model of Christ owning us. It's based off of love. And it is built or based off of the fact that Christ wants the absolute very best for us. And in your marriage... As a wife, you ought to want the absolute very best for your husband. And husbands, you ought to want the absolute very best for your wife. And you do everything possible to make it happen, right? I mean, that's what marriage ought to be. And dedication 
requires acknowledging ownership. Here's the second thing. Let's go to Romans chapter 12 and put a marker here if you would. Romans chapter 12. Probably one of the uh, best pictures of this that you can find in all of Scripture. Romans chapter 12, the second distinctive of dedication is that it requires an act of the will. It requires an act of the will. Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. It requires an act of the will. You present your own bodies. The picture that is given here comes straight out of the Old Testament, and the analogy is brought right into the New Testament with a New Testament twist. Imagine the scene in the Old Testament. You've got to get a lamb for the sacrifice. So the lamb does not volunteer itself to be sacrificed. It doesn't raise one little hoof and go, take me. It doesn't do that. The person who is going to present the sacrifice to the priest for the priest's examination, they are going to go in and pick the sacrificial animal out of the flock. The lamb doesn't walk up to the executioner with its neck extended, taking a paw and saying, start here and go to here. Doesn't do that. Instead, it is held in place while its throat is cut. What would happen if the throat of that sacrificial lamb was cut a half an inch at a time? So about yay big, half an inch at a time, what would happen? Number one, it would be incredibly cruel. And if you study a little bit about how the Jewish nation, when they sacrificed these animals, they tried to do it in the most humane way possible. They wanted to make it go by as quickly, uh, as, uh, just as quickly as you possibly could. But if you did it just a half an inch of a time, at a time, can you imagine how that poor little lamb would just squirm and everything else trying to get away from it? Now, look at Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6, look at verse 13. In Romans 6 and verse 13, the Bible says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Verse 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey? whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Verse 19, I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. The word yield is an act of the will. That little Old Testament lamb had no act of its will. It was made to be the sacrifice. Dedication means I have an act of my will. I have a choice to make. And that decision that I make is to present myself as a, sacrifice, as a sacrifice upon God's altar. I bring myself willingly, Lord. And I say, Lord, I am to be dedicated to you. The third thing is this. It involves total surrender. That lamb. You could not take that lamb and put a quarter of it, half of it, on the altar, and the other quarter or half, or three quarters or other half, goes scurrying away and going, I'm out of here. You're not getting all of me. You and I are supposed to put, by an act of our will, all of ourselves on God's altar. That's what a sacrifice is. Every bit of ourselves. In Mark chapter 12, Jesus answered him, first of all, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Notice how many times the word all is used. That is a complete sacrifice. All. We are to give our all to the Lord. Nothing held back. Everything belongs to Him. All of us on that altar of sacrifice. But notice in Romans 12 again, the fourth thing is that we are a living sacrifice. We are asked to present our bodies a living sacrifice. That is an anomaly. 
those sacrifices in the Old Testament, they were dead sacrifices. So once that little lamb was killed, once that goat or whatever was killed and it was placed on the altar, it was done. That was it. But here we are, Christians, a living sacrifice. That means a living sacrifice can still do things. And that's what we're called to do. Take a look with me, if you will, in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, look with me at verse 20. The Apostle Paul shows this strange dichotomy of death and life. He says, I am crucified with Christ, but then what does he say? Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Go to the book of Colossians. Two more books to the right. Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, the Bible says, For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. See how you have this dead and life thing going on at the same time? As Christians, we have to willfully and joyfully walk ourselves right up to that altar, right up to God's altar, and we die to self. We are to voice the things like uh, John the Baptist said, He must increase, but I must decrease. We've got to be willing to say that we will take up our cross daily and follow Him. That is death and life. Not a part of us, all of us. And every bit of this death and life works to the Lord's honor and glory. Our plans, our desires, our ambitions, our thoughts, our ideas, every bit of that has, be, has got to be sacrificed to the Lord. We've got to give it up to the Lord so that we can live unto Christ. Here's the next thing. Dedication means cutting ourselves off from every other distraction. Dedication means cutting ourselves off from every other distraction. Commitment divides. It splits us up all over the place. Dedication is laser focused and it says, I am not going to be drawn in by a bunch of other things. Let's make this very, very practical. Ladies, how many of you are okay with it if your husband ogles other women? undresses them with their eyes, checks them out at the mall. How many of you ladies are okay with that? I just like to know how many weird women are here. Okay, kind of what I thought. Men, how many of you are okay with your wife checking out that hunky muscled guy that's out mowing his yard without his shirt on, and I mean, he's just got a bronze tan and six-pack abs and, and just, mm. How many of you ladies are, or guys are okay with your wife checking that out? Okay, I didn't think so. Dedicated marriages are not okay with that because it goes against what dedication means. Romans chapter 12, look at verse 2, where your marker is at. The Bible says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How in the world are we going to not be conformed to this world? We live in it, right? It surrounds us all the time. And yet Paul told the church of Corinth, he says, come out from among the world and do what? Be separate. And here now we are told not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So we as believers in Christ are to be called out of this world. We are to be saturated. We are to be immersed in the things of God. This, you know, the, the sad thing is, is that the average Christian sitting in churches today and the average teenager, you could take a poll back to the teenagers and you will find out that they know more about the world's culture, the world's movies, the world's whatever, the world's music and everything else than they know about the Word of God. That's a problem. That is a problem. And my guess is that that might even be true sitting with the adults or going back into the younger kids with the Olympians. They know the different things that are going on in the world, but are very ignorant of the things in God's Word. That is not the way it ought to be for a Christian. 
Where in the world did we get this odd mindset that that's a good thing, that that's a normal thing, that that's a right thing, that it's an okay thing? Where did we get that idea? You would think of all the people in this world that ought to know the Word of God. It ought to be the people that come into the church. It ought to be the families that are represented by us right here. Wouldn't you think so? Well, you see, that's the difference between dedication and commitment. Commitment says, I'm going to spread my wings and fly. I got to know a little bit of this, I got to know a little bit of this, get involved in that, and get da 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 da. Why, our kids, if they didn't watch the latest thing that was on television, why, they would be ostracized by all their friends at school. <gasps> How tragic. Let me tell you something most of the friends that they have at school, they don't need them. And once they get out of school, they won't have them. Oh, but it's so important. Hey, I went down that road. You know how many I'm in contact with? How many I'm close to that I graduated with? Zilch. Not a one. You say, well, that's your fault, preacher. You could be. I take that back. Miss Laura and I graduated together. Okay, one. <laughs> Sorry. She was in my class. We got other strikerites, Rhonda and Doug and Gary and, uh, okay. Don't push my analogy too far. But I mean, think about it, folks. We put so much emphasis on being connected to the world, but not the connection that is needed to the things of the Lord. And something's wrong with that. It's not dedication. The final point is that maybe as I'm talking tonight, you're thinking, oh, preacher, that's really extreme. And that's just really extreme to go that far and, and, and talking about that and everything. I don't see anything wrong with being committed. Boy, you got to know a little bit of this. You got to do a little bit of that. I don't know about this. Well, Romans 12 again, one more time. Notice the last one, two, three, five words of verse 1, which is your reasonable service. Dedication is reasonable. Total Dedication is reasonable service. The Believer's Bible Commentary says it's our reasonable service in this sense. If the Son of God has died for me, then the least I can do is live for Him. If Jesus Christ be God and died for me, said the great British athlete C.T. Studd, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for Him. Isaac Watts' great hymn says the same thing. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my heart, my life, my all. That's dedication. That is not commitment. It is dedication. And it's our reasonable service. Reasonable. The Greek word is logikos or logikos, from which we would get the word logic. At the base root of that word is the word logos, from which is, we get the word word. It is what the Bible refers to itself. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. It is a title for the Lord Jesus Christ. So it is reasonable. It is logical. Total dedication is logical according to the Word of God. The word service. The word service is works that are done for God as worship. So putting it all together, all this extreme dedication is logical according to the Word of God and is done as work and worship rendered to God. So this isn't outlandish. If it seems extreme, and I can prove something. I, I think I can prove something. There are levels. There might be some sitting here tonight go, wow, mind-blowing. I mean, that's just far side pendulum swinging. I mean, that's just, whoa, way out there. Then that means you're not dedicated not even walking close to being dedicated. Others might say, well, it does seem a little extreme. But I can see the point. You're bringing this pendulum up a little bit, getting closer. Others are maybe saying, that's right. That's where I want to be. I want to have my all on the altar for the Lord. I don't want it to be just a song we sing at church. I want it to be the truth. Then that's the individual that's ready to dedicate themselves. You know, that's something we've got to do on a daily basis, moment-by-moment moment basis. God's got to have our all, not some. 
every bit. Tonight, as you sit here as a Christian, where do you put yourself concerning dedication? And ask what you're committed, if you're committed. You say, well, yeah, we just had the Sunday school list of officers. My name's on there 10 times. That's commitment. Yeah, you're right. That doesn't necessarily mean it's dedication. Are you dedicated? God's called us to dedication, and we really need to look at our life to see if we are. Let's go back to that marriage analogy. There's decision, there's commitment, there's dedication. If you're here without Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have not yet made the right decision. So commitment, dedication, don't even worry about that. You haven't even made a decision for Christ. You don't, even, you don't belong to the family of God. If you were to die and leave this world in death, you are not going to heaven. You're on your way to an eternity in hell. So you could be the most... And by the way, lost people are committed in churches. I mean, there's a lot of churches, they've got always people that are doing something, right? So you can easily be committed. But dedicated, you got to be saved first. And Jesus Christ dedicated himself by dying on Calvary's cross, full death, full sacrifice. And he was buried in a tomb, and he rose from the grave, and he gave his life so that you could live but I wonder tonight, lost soul, would this be the night you'd finally say, Jesus, I need you. I'm not saved, and I desperately need to be saved tonight. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed. If that's you this evening, you have never made that decision to trust Jesus as your Savior. Romans 10 verse 9 says that if thou shalt call or believe in thine heart, that thou shalt call upon the name of the Lord and be saved, you will be saved. The Bible makes it very, very clear. You have to believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, that he was buried in the tomb, he arose again from the grave, and that he did it for you. Are you willing tonight to confess that to him? Would you just pray something like this? Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I do not deserve the gift of salvation. Tonight, Lord, I deserve eternity in hell. But I do believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins on Calvary's cross. That he shed his blood for me. That he was buried in the tomb and that he arose again from the grave. And tonight, Lord, I ask you to come into my heart and save me. I am calling upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. Have you done that tonight? You say, I've never done that before. I did that tonight. Would you just slip your hand up this evening? And our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your plan of salvation and the fact that you love us so much that you reach out to every lost soul. And if there is one tonight that still has never trusted you as Savior, we pray before they leave this place they would get things settled and right with you. Lord, we pray for believers in Christ this evening that we might hunger and desire to be dedicated wholly to you. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.